Uh, I'm Brett Littman. I'm the director of the Osama Noguchi Foundation and Garden Museum. And I'm really happy today to talk to Sam Moyer, uh, who has a, a beautiful show up uh, at Sean Kelly Gallery called Tone uh, that's up uh, until April 24th. And I highly recommend if you have a chance uh, to do a nice socially distanced uh, visit to the gallery and take a walk, uh, get some fresh air and take a look at the wonderful show that she's put together. All righty, I think we're at about, looks like about 35 people and 302. So maybe Sam, if you're, if you're ready, um, I'm ready. We can get, we can get started. I'm ready. Good. So Sam, um, it was really great uh, two weeks ago to be able to come and visit with you at the gallery and to see uh, the, the exhibition tone and walk through with you. And there are a couple of things that we've talked about that have kind of stayed in my mind. Uh, and I wanted to start off a little bit with some uh, things that, that we, you mentioned about your history, your own family, um, because I think it kind of gave me a little bit of new perspective. I mean, we know each other uh, over the years, you know, you showed some work at the Drawing Center, uh, obviously, we also worked with Eddie and we've seen each other in Japan of all places in uh, Kyoto, you know, for a nice uh, soba, uh, random soba dinner, um, which was a lot of fun. Um, but I would say that um, there were one or two things that you told me, uh, particularly about your mother, uh, who was a, a therapist, and um, about making toys or objects for her uh, patients to play with um, while she was doing therapy. And I just wondered uh, very quickly, and I'm not asking this as like, please don't lie down on a couch or anything, we don't have to go too detailed, but just some of the, what those toys might look like, and whether or not those were in your house and things that you kind of have memories of. Yes. So uh, when I was 10, my mom went back to school to become a therapist and she uh, studied, you know, young, young in therapist was just like heavily into Joseph Campbell and um, something that she took sort of uniquely as an artist coming into that was this idea of the ruin and uh, the, the object that could be used as a therapeutic tool. And so she made her own and uh, the objects were definitely around the house and they were these amazing projects she did that she used in practice. And one that I remember very vividly is um, these stones that she collected off the beach. I think like the beaches, I think California beaches, but also the beaches that we spent a lot of time at in Indiana. And she would paint symbols on those stones and then they would be buried in this I'd say like a cauldron, like a big bucket of sand. And this was a tool she used with patients. I think, I don't know. I mean, I was a kid, but the memory I have is that it was a way to start a conversation, spark a conversation. So the person would dig through the sand, pull up a stone, there'd be a symbol on the stone. And then that my mom would explain what the, you know, what the symbol meant. The And then that would sort of start a conversation or help spark an idea. And maybe... It was a practice they used multiple times, or maybe they used it when someone was stuck or didn't quite know how to express something, but I think it might have also been just a way to think about um, bringing in like a tangible outside thing into talk therapy as a, a bridge maybe between, uh, just sort of, maybe it like is bridging a gap between therapist and patient as like a thing to, to create the conversation, but also maybe thinking about like these shapes and symbols in the outside world, actually being able to relate and um, help explain internal thoughts and mm -hmm. feelings. Well, it's interesting because Jung, um, obviously the Bo in Bolijan, you know, he had his kind of rune stone that was this great sculptural work that was really the culmination of a lot of his own thinking that still exists if you go visit his house in Switzerland. Yeah. Um, and so obviously um, the, the idea of an object that one can play with and one can also think through um, is, is quite fascinating. What we're watching here is a little video I made on Sunday um, of your piece Untitled that you did for ICI. Um, and you had given me, uh, I think uh, one of the, the edition a couple of years ago and I've had it in my house for quite a while. Um, it sits mostly on my counter, uh, kitchen counter, but it does move around. Um, and I have to say that uh, it's one of those pieces where, 
um, I, I have to take care of it. I'm constantly shifting it. it. If it moves a little bit, something kind of bumps up. I mean, it, it's a little bit unstable um, in a beautiful kind of way. Um, it evokes a lot of, uh, I, I actually think a strong emotional response. I really love the idea of these clasped uh, fingers. Um, and when you were talking about your mother and particularly this idea of these therapeutic tools, um, I, I spent a, you know, a good 30 minutes kind of putting your piece together, taking it apart, trying it out in a lot of different configurations. Do you think something like those, those works uh, maybe have some you know, deep reference to some of the things that your mom was doing or just out of curiosity? I think so. I think that if it, I'd, I'd say the foundation of it is that my mom probably opened my eyes to this um, object connection to like the physical object connection to some kind of problem solving or spirituality or representation of um you know some kind of mental path that you need to take and my mom was also really into labyrinths uh and so moving your physical body touching something and all of a sudden you can project uh and and have like a, a back and forth not just projection but also like a listening relationship with an object and that's what I really was excited about with the scale of this one is my work is usually so big it, it's very locked in place and with this it's almost like you can experience the process I go through when uh, trying to find you know where things connect how they should balance what that sort of intuitive engineering is to see the moment that something works but then it also exists in all of these ways. It exists in a flat way. It exists horizontally, vertically. It balances, it falls. It sort of goes through the gamut of um, a lot of the sort of emotions <laughs> that we go through as human beings. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's codependent, but it's also two separate individual things that have their own substance. Um, well, so what I love about it is it can kind of break down. I mean, sometimes I have to take it away if I'm cleaning or, or whatever. And, you know, it can just kind of almost, I, I put it in my bookshelf like a book yeah. and then take it back out. And I, I love seeing it with a little kind of, um, you know, the, pro, the, pro, the, 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 the uh, how would I call them, I guess, uh, these points, you know, connection that just like stick out of the bookcase. Um, it's quite flexible. You did mention this term, and, and I also have been thinking about this idea of intuitive engineering. The other thing that you told me was that you come from a long line of uh, engineers, I mean, in your family, maybe people who built the California railroads. Um, in particularly in the body of work uh, that you're showing at uh, Sean Kelly, which builds from like Fisher's Hinge and Doors for Doris, and also your Pine Hinge, which you showed at King Griffin Corcoran at a much larger scale, um, you have a new series called Dependence, uh, which I think are very much related to um, these, the untitled piece for ICI and the series of other uh, works that I just mentioned. But one of the things about your work is that your engineering is um, very intuitive. It, you, the, your process of um, making the hinge itself and the kind of the cuts and the way in which you structure this it, is not necessarily like you're using AutoCAD uh, to you know, um, perfectly make these joints. I mean, in some ways, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you're thinking about th this hinge and the connection point. Uh, particularly in the works that we're uh, looking at at Sean Kelly. I'm going to show just a couple of very uh, deep details and then we'll kind of expand out uh, so we can see some of them in, in full screen. Sure. Um, intuitive engineering, I think, is me fully indulging and in doing what I want without following the rules of said thing. So I feel like often things are presented to us, like Japanese joinery is presented to us and it's this beautiful you know, historical way of making something so structurally sound, but it involves a lot of measuring and skill and time. And I often am like, oh, I'm really interested in that as a shape or an idea, but I'm gonna throw away all of the things that make it mm -hmm. hard. <laughs> and I'm gonna completely do it the way I want to, which is quickly. And I think that the intuitive engineering part actually comes with trying to like find a point of balance or figure out you know, how many forks it'll take to actually connect something or if the bottom has to be a little bit wider than the top. And so that's just something that I, I just have, which is awesome. And I'm really great. So you can, you can see that in an object right away or I is that kind of trial, trial and error? I can see it in an object right away. I can say that's going to work. That's not going to work. Hmm. So what that does is, um, frees me up a little bit to, 
go nuts with whatever I want to do. Also, I mean, there, there's space for failure, of course, but with these, they, they relate directly to drawing. And so to take all of the math and the hard stuff and, you know, the things that would discourage me from making this sculpture myself, I just eliminate that. And I started with a drawing and I drew a shape into a piece of stone scrap that I had. And then, okay, so now I have one side of that fork, right? And so then I matched it up with um, a piece of material I was gonna turn into a mold and I drew the other half of it. And then, so really it's sort of like Adam and the rib, you know, it's like one mm -hmm. gets the next one. And then once the two pieces are made, it's a little bit of a meditative focus process of getting those two to connect and balance. And some of them click together really easily and some of them are hard. Yeah. It uh, can be one of those things where the first time you do it, it takes two minutes. Next time you do it, two people are watching you, waiting for you to set it up and it takes 20 minutes. And you're like, mm -hmm. I swear I did this. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, even with your untitled piece, I've had many times, I mean, I, I play around with the configurations, but you know, of course I know the five or six ways that it kind of can be steady and put together. But even I have to sometimes sit there for a couple of minutes, extra minutes and go, I don't know what's happened here. It, it's just not sitting right, or I have to move it just a little bit. So, you know, it, it's it's super fascinating. I mean, I think I told you that Noguchi, um, with his uh, interlocking sculptures, we've had to build a whole set of wooden maquettes um, and send them along with the sculpture when we we send those out for other shows, so that the registrars can kind of play around first um, to make them. A lot of those pieces were made in slate or marble. They're yeah. super thin. They're quite fragile. Others are in bronze or steel as additions. Uh, they're a little bit more um, durable, but there is one piece which is kind of like this, where three pieces have to intersect perfectly, and it's a real puzzle to put together. It, it I've tried to make that one uh, with our registrar, and it took us about 35 minutes to get it right, so I can totally understand this weird, it's a dance. I mean, it's almost like choreography. Um, yeah. Your body funny. becomes very involved. And also, do you notice that be, with the with the smaller piece that you play with at home, that it's um, like you have a muscle memory of configurations that worked before and you try to get back there, but it's not that you necessarily like can perfectly visualize it or know exactly what you're after, but you just know that feeling where it clicks and the weight feels right. Mm -hmm. Like that is something that I seek a lot in yeah. work, that, that sort of knowing moment in my body. <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about, you had mentioned uh, Vladimir Osipov uh, to me. I, I wasn't familiar with his work, but then I did look him up and a great uh, Russian modernist living in Hawaii, but grew up in Japan. So one of those fantastic, uh, you know, turn of the century stories um, uh, of someone who's kind of ends up in the most unlikely place. And he was born in Vladivostok, which is, you know, a cold port town. So, you know, for him, Hawaii would be probably the other, totally other end of the earth. but. Um, we were talking about the materials. I mean, obviously, you know, in many of your works, you use discarded uh, marble and other materials that you might find from kitchen renovations or things like that, or tabletops in a park. Um, but here, the interlocking pieces, uh, the piece in white, you have cast, uh, and it's also with stone. And you were kind of saying that maybe thinking about Ossipov's houses, which were very much... Um, in line and in, in concert with nature. Um, he was very interested in kind of creating a modernism that was um, in, in touch with its environment. Um, could you talk a little bit about your decision to, to work with this cast uh, concrete, I guess, and, and, and to put the stones inside of it to make that contrast? Yeah, absolutely. So the thing I love about Ospov, I learned about Ospov through my friend Mika Tajima. And, um, the thing I love about him is that these, you know, it's like he's still using these brutalist materials of concrete, but he's opening these spaces up so that they're part of nature. So in a way they're um, so intense and heavy and dark, but also incredibly light and um, sort of seamlessly moving into the landscape. And one of the techniques he used that I really liked was he, when he built a wall, he would take local rocks from the site and he would slam them into the mold for the wall with raw clay. And then they would pour the concrete. And then when they would remove the mold, the clay would have dried, he pulls the clay out and then the rock is exposed inside the wall. And so I really like that as like, not only just the architect's hand in the space, it also gives it that site specificity of, 
you know, the material from the actual location becoming part of the building. And just the reveal of the, the natural stone amidst the concrete is such a, um, I don't know, great reveal to me. And, and then it also, you know, is like uh, an aggregate with quotation marks around it, like such an extreme example of, of aggregate. So when I decided to hand make the, uh, a portion of these sculptures, I wanted to bring in aggregate, which was, you know, specific to a location that I cared about, which are the beaches of Long Island. And then there's also a scrap from my studio in there. And I used Ossipoff's technique of uh, putting clay in the mold to expose the stone. So when I pulled the mold out, you know, I pulled that clay out and then that's how you get those like big chunks of uh, exposed rock. I really like the juxtapositions here. I mean, obviously, um, because of this uh, hand cast uh, center uh, piece with its forks holding up the two other more grayer and, and stippled slate or marble. Um, and particularly, it, we, I mean, I told you right away, I said, oh, it reminds me a lot of like La Jolla. I went to school at UC San Diego, like Southern California architecture as well, where there were a lot of these kind of concrete stone walls, um, you know, by the beach, you know, kind of you'd see them in people's homes or outside of their homes. Um, so it really kind of also brought me back to a, a very specific uh, kind of architecture, you know, that I also experienced, um, which I, I really liked. It's interesting with the pieces, the dependence that you uh, have at, at Sean Kelly's gallery. I mean, as you have to scale up and scale down from Untitled uh, to um, to these kinds of works, which, should, you know, lowest might be two feet, highest might be four or five feet, um, it, these are a lot more tenuous in terms of their balancing acts that they need to do. I mean, obviously, if you're working outside um, or if you're working uh, in a place like for public art, you know, the engineering requirements are a lot more stringent. You can't have anything that's going to fall over. Um, but here you told me that none of these are pinned, um, you know, that these are kind of balanced and obviously you know, we were there and your friend was there with the baby. Um, you know, we didn't watch the baby kind of run up to the sculpture, but she did mention that to us. And I was thinking, oh no, you know, but I kind of like the danger aspect of it. It's, it's, yeah. it's kind of fun. So why, you know, d does this pose different kinds of challenges for you? I mean, obviously you have to think about these in a different way. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, I think it might've been a subconscious breakaway from the strict engineering I had to do for Doris for Doris and all of those conversations and, and you know, the sort of cloud that forms around a project of like regulation mm -hmm. and the compromises you have to make for that. And so to really bring it back into the studio and really just do it with my hands, I wanted it to also be like the presentation was a performance that I, I did. Um, but yes, they're totally dangerous. And I worry about babies and dogs. And, uh, you know, we will probably figure out a way to cheat it. But I think so that they're stabilized if they ever go somewhere. But I really think that that danger is part of the <laughs> excitement around these pieces. No, well, I, I think these works, you do have a responsibility. I mean, like you have a responsibility to a painting if you buy something and, you know, you probably don't want to put it over your fireplace and have soot on, you know, getting on it or smoke in front of it for 20 or 30 years, but some people do do that. Um, but with a sculpture like this, you know, you, you would, it's a little bit like the little one, the untitled one, I have to manage it. Yeah. It, it's like a pet in the house, you know, I have to deal with it, It's and which I love. I mean, I it's not that's a- something that I do, maybe that's like an interesting thing to do is like have a session with a person who's interested in owning a piece like this, where we practice balancing it together and it becomes something that they also can engage in, you know? Yeah. Because um, I think that that's an interesting, it's an interesting meditative thing for me to do. And I, I feel sort of that adrenaline of success when it locks into place. Well, I mean, I'm not uh, advising you on the strategy, uh, but you know, I do know an artist, uh, Daniel Brush, who um, refuses to sell anything to anyone unless they come over to a studio, hold the object in his hand, and he feels they're worthy of having the work, uh, which is taking that to another level. But nonetheless, um, you know, it, it it is an interesting idea that one buys something and then has to kind of, you know, be taught how to how to how to uh, care for it. Yeah, the participating, of course, comes from care. I mean, it is it's it's a very direct etymology. It's kind of an interesting way of of thinking about it. Yeah, I think it really activates the relationship with the the piece. You know, it's like the piece isn't just performing for you and guaranteeing its existence. Like you have to participate. 
So I want to kind of, um, and, and I think my approach to this talk was kind of the zoom in, zoom out concept, because um, your work, obviously, uh, for me, it, it, it starts off in some of the details and um, some of the juxtapositions. And then, um, obviously, there is the full environment of the work itself. Uh, this is the entranceway to the show uh, in the gallery with uh, two of the dependents and one of your uh, paintings uh, leading into the other space. But I wanted to kind of focus in on the array uh, in this room. And obviously here you have some horizontal, some vertical pieces, um, some different scaled works. Um, the room is actually pretty dark. Uh, you, you wanted it a little bit more like you said natural light in there. Um, so it has, I mean, there are spotlights on the works, but it's not like it's a super, super bright room. Um, also, the show is called Tone. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, obviously you've created a little bit of a moody uh, space uh, for these sculptures to be in. Um, were there any thoughts about that in terms yeah. of- I mean, I think, color? yeah, you work with the environment that, that you're given, right? So yes, I would love for these to be in like a sun-drenched room yeah. <laughs> or outdoors um but that's just not how the space is at sean's and it's a beautiful gallery but the the lighting situation just isn't that and so how do i work with what i'm given and i was like well let's just go the opposite direction and ramp up the drama and the the texture on these pieces is so wild and the you know they feel very photographic in their positive negative space due to the the shadows and the light that um i thought it was kind of like a fun adventure to to do this theatrical lighting in there or, well and also because the pieces change so dramatically as you walk around them i mean they they have many many faces more than just two i mean they probably have six they're almost like a, yeah. a dance in a way um yeah and every side's different like the the even just the the way that the stone is exposed through the concrete on the handmade ones you know it's like one side is the stone's fully revealed, the other side is more sunken in or it's a different type of concrete. There, yeah, there's a lot of components. And I think I was trying to encourage sort of a path, you know, like bringing back to the labyrinth, thinking about a garden or, or some kind of space where you're invited to walk through them. Yeah, it definitely has that feeling. And, and I think that um, you do create that ability, almost like a Japanese garden, you know, where you've, you take a journey. Um, yeah. Interestingly, the piece, there's a little piece around the corner, um, which I think you called uh, Study for Sean, uh, which is maybe a fragment of something else that you were beginning to work on. Um, and I really love it's like this kind of rising sun, uh, you know, that you that reveals and looking over these uh, dependents, uh, these objects. One of the things you told me is that oftentimes you are working on the floor. So your process is very much a kind of looking down. Um, this piece uh, obviously then becomes wall mounted as many of your paintings do, um, but I found that one to be a kind of interesting little uh, strange anonymous, uh, or not anonymous, a strange thing that was in that room, uh, very different from the other things. Yeah, anomaly, sorry. Yeah. And, and I think that with the with the dramatic lighting and then that piece is like this little reveal or anchor on the other side of the room and it feeling like a sun we just it just created such a narrative it's it's truly like a piece of set <laughs> theater set in there which is also you know what I was raised in do, thanks to my dad so I can tend to like you know when planning a show sort of think about it as uh building an environment for people to be in um but yeah i think that 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 piece on the wall sort of again like bridges a few things in my practice like the sculptural practice to the painting practice and uh exposes my process a little bit mm -hmm. so it just it felt like a nice thing to hang there um and has a relationship a lot like the sculptures where it's just two components coming together but in a completely different outcome you know yeah well it still has that uneasy balancing feel <laughs> which yeah. i think is per permeates a lot of your work even in the in the constructed paintings as well yeah uh, i did want to mention sorry at the beginning i forgot to say if you have questions we will do a q a at the end um please just put them in the chat we're going to kind of uh power through the the talk part and then i'll go through and we'll we'll be able to answer those questions at that time um, so I apologize about that a little housekeeping that I did not do well, but um, 
I wanted to talk a little bit about surfaces. Um, obviously, I think in your work, uh, the, the surfaces are so important. Um, you told me that in um, this show, you've you've made a little bit of, I don't want to call it a breakthrough, but you, you've changed the way that you're dealing with your surface a little bit, uh, particularly around uh, the acrylic uh, and now using plaster on the canvas, which gives it a little bit more depth as opposed to a, a more flat uniform surface. Could you talk a little bit about how that came about and, and how that changes the work for you and, and maybe in terms of dimensionality? Um, because I think in, in your work, you're always kind of on that fulcrum of the pictorial versus the sculptural. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it, this seems like a very simple move to make, but actually it kind of opens up uh, a lot more space in your pictorial side. Yeah, it's an interesting yeah. shift, I think, in that way where I have this thing where I want everything to be a photograph, a sculpture, and a painting all in one. Like, how, how do I make it everything all together? And so these, the, the part that uh, Brett's talking about is the pink surround around the stone. And in the past, it was cam painted canvas. So it really represented like a painting. And then the stone was the sculptural element. And now I'm covering it in plaster and making sort of a um, layman's fresco around it. And by adding another sculptural material, I've just opened up this world of, of texture and um, ways to control light and, and shape around these things in a way that I just didn't have with the painting. But the painting is, but they're still painted. So some are, you know, the pigment is part of the plaster and they feel a little more sculptural and maybe relate more to like building material and other ones they're sanded down and there's like 10 layers of acrylic on them. And I'm, I was trying to like sort of think about Monet even and, and that impressionist attempt at, at creating dimensionality through light um, or through the rendering of light rather. Um, and yeah, it, it, having the component with the stone be something that also is a building material also sort of you know is one of the original art supply and something that you would make a wall out of <laughs> felt mm -hmm. like a cleaner um metaphor or, or narrative for these pieces and i'm pretty excited about the directions i could go with it no, no there, it's it also you it's a very obviously beautiful surface that has a little bit more kind of depth uh, mm -hmm. to do it. Um, of course, one can do that with acrylics. I mean, you can um, use oils and beeswax and other things to create and build up that kind of surface. But I think that here, I love the idea that you're painting with stone. I mean, fundamentally, exactly. It, exactly. That, that's, that's what it is. Um, painting with stone. And then the other thing is that is it really gives me a chance to put my physical hand in it. So some of them actually have like my fingerprints or, or hand moving the plaster around. Some of them are sanded all the way down, but um, you know, it, it gives me that ability to sort of have that range. You, you mentioned that kind of um, totalitizing uh, way that you like to work, which is, I want my photography, I want my painting, I want my sculpture. Um, you did study photography. How, how do you see photography kind of affecting um, the, the 2D and 3D works that you do? Um, you're, is it a, a building an image? Is it, how, how does that kind of, that line come through? Well. I would say the very first photography skill that I use the most is editing. Mm -hmm. And editing is something that you study as a photographer that I don't think they teach you in any other form of art. Well, it but it depends if you're a Cartier-Bresson, you know, decisive moment. But then of course you look at his um, contact sheets and you see lots of decisive moments. Yeah. I agree with you because I also studied photography and took a lot of pictures and developed. I mean, I think the great thing about photography is editing. You, you learn how to look at many images and you have to choose one. Exactly. So that editing muscle just builds up over time. And I think it has developed an ability for me to say that works, that doesn't work. And no, um, yeah, a, a pictorial landscape or no, you know, where in a formal group of objects, you know, something should, where the weight should be or where the counterpoint should be or, or how to make, you know, it, when something's too comfortable or when something's too hard. Um, and so I'd say editing is the number one thing. And then, so, so editing and light. And light has just been something I've always been obsessed with. I think it's everything. And so one of the first things I was interested in making these stone pieces was to have something that was reflective and something that was absorbent. 
So these two contrasting things end up making these 2D things also very 3D in a way where as you move around them, the pieces reveal themselves differently as the light moves across the surface because you have one thing that's each, each uh, part of these works is experiencing and projecting and reflecting light in a different way. Um, so I don't know that they encompass the way light the way photography encompasses light, but photography made me aware of light as a powerful art supply. <laughs> yeah, well, light is a, a very powerful art supply and one in hopefully great abundance and definitely one that changes our pers perspective um, yeah. endlessly. I mean, I can see this a piece like this, you know, if you hung it in a in, in a kind of modernist glass house, you know, and, and watch the light reflect over it during the course of the day, I imagine that this piece would reveal itself in hundreds and hundreds of different ways. Oh, completely. And there's so many layers in the painting, you know, it's like, in certain lightings that under layer just comes forth and it's a very dark work. And then in very bright settings, all the light bounces off that white top layer and it, it's so bright, you know, it's like, it just looked like a white painting. I mean, I think it's, it, this one is called Daisy Chain, um, obviously a kind of maybe reference to the daisy chain of the objects uh, precariously balancing one on top of the other. Um, but one thing about this one, which is a little different than other paintings that I feel that you've made is that that cross hatching and really the much more, um, if I dare say, muscular kind of uh, use of the plaster uh, brushstroke, you know, creates a lot of tension. Um, because a lot of times your work, it floats. It has this very ethereal floating quality. This one, I feel that there's a lot more compression and tension in. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure, I, I you know, I, I remember looking through all of them. Th this one seems to kind of stand out for that, that ability to almost the, 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 paint, the, the paint strokes are almost holding up the objects rather than letting them float in the, in the background. This piece is so funny. It, it gets a lot of attention because I think it's got so much energy to it. Mm -hmm. That's just a very in your face energy versus the, like you were saying, kind of quieter hum of the other works. And it was the last painting, last work I made for the show. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes when you are basically done with a show and you are like, I'm just gonna, this is gonna keep going. There's this like permission granted. Yeah. There's this space to just just do it because you know it's like you have your insurance of everything else. <laughs> so this yeah, you've got your like you got your fifteen other paintings in, right yeah. in the bag, and you're like, you know what? I'm gonna just step out I'm on the off the cliff right now. Yeah, I'm just gonna do it. And these were like some random scraps that were laying around. I usually have you know there's there's tonal relationships between the stones, or it's like there's some patterning or it's a stone in of itself in a relationship to itself. And these were completely random scraps that I laid down really quickly. And, you know, I, lay, I, I think that the energy of being like, screw it, let's do it. Let's just make the piece um, then was reflected. I mean, I painted it very quickly too. Um, I just knew exactly what I wanted to do. And I think that that's, it, there's also this thing where when you finish a show, you know, all of a sudden you know exactly what you want to do for your next show, you know? <laughs> so yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's nice to have that passageway. I mean, it's a little bit like writing a poem and the last word of the poem gives you the first word of the next, the next poem. Exactly. You could write or something along those lines, these kinds of self-generating systems. Um, yeah, so like it's I was, nice. And I was, this show was so hard to make and it was like, my joke is it was like squeezing blood from a stone. Like it was just, it was so tight and working so hard to make everything important and good. <laughs> well, you did tell me, I mean, you kind of, you said you had to abandon like for the first couple of pieces that you made while, you know, like when you're starting to begin to plan for this, you know, yeah. you, you made a couple of things and you're like, nope, don't, can't, not working for me. Yeah. I mean, you know, and then you just had to start again, but it is nice. And it's, I, I didn't know that Daisy Chain was kind of the end of that progression, which of course, in a way gives it the title itself is a kind of wonderful hint yeah. of that idea. You know, it's the end of the Daisy Chain and it's also the beginning of something new. Um, uh, so I do want to talk a little bit about titles. You mentioned to me that you do spend a, a fair amount of time on the titles of your works and that maybe that's where you kind of encode some personal information or thoughts and other things. Um, you know, for instance, uh, th the next kind of general concept that I want to talk about is, for lack of a better way of saying it, wonky geometry, because I think your work has this um, feel. I mean, every time I look at one of your works, I really love the asymmetry of them. There's something that doesn't resolve uh, for my eye. Um, you, you, you want, I want to make the rectangle or I want to make the square. Or I want the piece, the jagged piece to kind of end at the right place. 
But a lot of times you push the, the stone or sometimes the canvas or you, you abruptly delete part of the canvas. I mean, you create these kinds of moments where the eye has to do a lot of work. Um, and I really enjoy that aspect of, of your paintings because they're, they're not easy. Um, and, and not that they're hard and bad, but I'm just saying that they create a pictorial space um, that for me makes me have to work a little bit more. So for instance, I just took a couple of details. Uh, this piece is called uh, Hound of Heaven. Um, any insights on the title that you could give us before we, I move on to the bigger? Well, it was named Hound of Heaven after the poem, but um, more just like a uh, moment that happened where now I, I have this thing where I can't remember anyone's name. If Eddie's watching, he's like laughing at me right now. But basically- This is something in the chat, Eddie. <laughs> Stephen Colbert interviewed that Phoebe lady that wrote uh, Fleabag. Do you know who I'm talking about? Anyway, she's cool. She's a writer. And Stephen Colbert was so excited to think that maybe she had based this fox character, this fox, the, an actual animal fox, in her TV show on the Hound of Heaven that he recited the entire poem to her. And it was one of those like beautiful little moments that I saw on like, I don't know, social media or something. Where I was just like, oh my God, just like opening this window into like the depths of the true care and hope of Stephen Colbert. <laughs> and she was like, I wish. No, I've never heard that before. <laughs> so I don't know, it's just, you know, it's like, that's the thing is, and then you're thinking about it, it's such a beautiful poem and this piece really feels, cause it's all about like the positive and the negative and, and the highs and the lows. And it just felt like such a um, good mirror of sort of the emotional roller coaster of COVID. And this piece, like you were saying is hard. It's, um, it's got these beautiful, easy palette, but then the edges are so rough and, and it's got sort of like a meanness to it. And so it felt, that's a very long-winded explanation of the title, but do yeah. You keep, do you keep lists of titles or do these titles just come at the end of- They tend to come at the end. Well, so I keep lists randomly in different places and I can't find them. So okay. I'm forever like, ah. Oh. That's crap of paper that I had that great title for that painting. <laughs> exactly. Eddie and I always laugh because we had like a perfect baby name at one point, like, years before we even thought about having a baby. Have you guys lost it? Yeah, we lost it. We have no idea what it was. <laughs> right. so somewhere <laughs> along the way in your personal archive, there's going to be like a thousand great names of paintings that are going to be on little scraps of paper in some some box behind your, your cabinet. Yeah, they're like on the notes on the iPad under the bed that like doesn't connect to the notes on my phone, you know, some nightmare. Um, but yeah, I, I, I tend to kind of like mentally collect them, but I don't title the work until the show's over usually and then just apply those things to. And like for this show, I had a list of maybe 80 to 100 titles and then I'm sort of like have to go through and um, see if any of them actually are applicable to the work and mm -hmm. often it's not. And then the work sort of reveals its own title to me after I've done all that legwork. <laughs> this one is called Big Secret. I mean, I really love this little kind of arabesque uh, ending point. Um, obviously, maybe this piece was some kind of reclaim countertop or a table. I mean, who knows? Um, yeah. You know, and, and the fact that it kind of juts out uh, and, it, you know, it, it's basically, I'll get to the larger um, image here. Um, actually several areas that jut out but I mean here you know you have this beautiful little end piece and then up here you have this jagged top I mean so when you're building these are you starting first with the um, laying out the stones on your floor and then thinking about the canvas built around that do you ever start with canvas I mean obviously the stones have to fit in the canvas so you can't really just start with canvas I mean otherwise unless you're cutting stone um, usually you leave the stone or the found marble or whatever it is in the shape that it is, or do you ever cut it down further? I cut it down and I break it up. I'd say 80% of the time I leave it the way it is. I really try to keep it authentic to the way that I found it, but sometimes you just have to make it better mm -hmm. or make it work for the piece. Um, yeah, so I have the scraps of stone. I lay them on the floor. I move them around. Some pieces come together really quickly. Some take forever. Some live in some kind of combination on the floor for a really long time until a different piece of stone shows up in the studio and then all of a sudden it works 
this was one of those, I, I had two of these pieces and I could never, I had actually made a painting out of the rounder part of this piece um, that I ended up scrapping. So I had pulled that stone from a fully finished piece and look, and at some point a different group of marble stone came into the studio and I got the long leg on the right hand side. And suddenly I was like, oh, I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it just, it, they kind of reveal themselves over time. And it, it's pretty hard to go from, it's hard to scrap a work for me because it takes so long to make one. <laughs> They're so involved and labor intensive. So to get it all the way to the point where it's like painted, cleated on the wall and I'm like. Nope, yeah, and to deconstruct it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, oh, sorry, when, sorry what, when does color kind of come into the equation? I mean, how do you, when do you start thinking about that? Uh, I probably start thinking about it when I start choosing the stones. Mm -hmm. This one was painted three different colors. I'm telling you, the show was hard. Um, yeah. <laughs> this one went through a lot of evolutions. It also was fully finished without the left-hand corner. And then I had to add the left-hand corner because it felt unresolved. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, usually I know exactly what color to do and I'm right on it. This one happened to be a hard one. Um, and then with the title, Big Secret, it just, it kind of is self-explanatory. It's like these two figures holding this object between. Mm -hmm. I also kind of see a Doris for Doris uh, study yeah. as well, you know, kind of feeling of a portal or, mm -hmm. or a, you know, a place that we pass through. Yeah. Exactly. Somewhere else. Exactly. And then this, if we're into intuitive engineering is impossible engineering where it looks like doors for doors or something like that but actually if those were to exist yeah it would never work no it would fall yeah. <laughs> so the next piece the fragment uh the detail is from little pitcher um i also really kind of like this one this one is a little bit more if i dare say uh pictorial <laughs> because your work tends to not necessarily um, reveal some object per se, but here we do almost have a picture. It, it has a kind of very direct relationship to an object in the real world. Um, could you talk a little bit about this piece and kind of what you were thinking about and why this one seems to be less abstract in a way? Um, yeah, so that happens sometimes. It's a, you know, the it's like looking at clouds. Sometimes you just see something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and before I worked on this show, I did a lot of flowers. So I was doing these, um, these big flower paintings. So it just, every once in a while an object emerges and I just have to sort of have a meeting with myself and figure out if it's okay or not. Um, if I want it to be pictorial or if it's goofy or if it's okay. Mm -hmm. And with this one, this is one of those pieces that's hard because the stone is so powerful and so beautiful uh that it's just sort of enough on its own and so i think that the the intensity of the visual of the stone sort of cancels out the goofiness of you know a rendering of a picture <laughs> how many how many pieces of stone are there two stone three stones put together to make that there's three yeah three yeah yeah, and so that uh, right angle cut, that's an overcut. That's a that's what you get when people, you know, do a, when a stone cutter is creating a countertop or a table and you get that awesome overcut. And so that's often a moment that I can like fit, mm. nestle something into that perfect 90 degree angle. I always love when I find one of those. And then I think the handle is a piece that broke off from the top piece. Sam, I'm going to move through quickly um, the last pieces because I do want to get to the idea of the room tone. We talked a little bit about that. And um, maybe you can say just one or two words about why you chose tone as the title for this show. Um, you know, it's a, a tone is an interesting word at the moment. I mean, I think we're all kind of almost like trying to react to the tone of the world. And, and you know, we think about sound, we think about light, we think about the, the tonal qualities of something. Um, and then of course, there's the whole experience of taking in the tone of, of, a, of a space. Um, was there something in particular when that, that word popped into your head? You told me some of your friends did said, oh, don't call your show tone. That's not a good <laughs> word. <laughs> well, 
Well, I think that it's, yeah. So, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Everything you said is something I considered for the show. So it's the flexibility of the show. There's like an elasticity to it where it is color, it's light, it's mood. It's uh, often like the essence you're after when you're trying to think about how to bring a show together. Um, the word struck me as the buzzword that was used a lot uh, in the news while New York was in lockdown. And I was just such, like, like all of us, I was such a news junkie, you know, march through, well, I still am. But those first three months, just endlessly hoping for some kind of news, some kind of break um, in a story. And, and a lot of journalists were just talking about the tone, the tone of the political tone, this, the emotional tone, the, the vi it's really was like the vibration of the city. And, you know, Eddie and I stayed here the whole time in Brooklyn and just walking on the streets and, and that quietness, there was a, there was no other word that could really describe it other than the, the collective tone we all experienced. Um, and then, yeah, making my show on that. And um, I think it's one of those words, I really like it because it works so well visually. It's, I think it's a really beautiful word. And I think it's something that it's a really poetic word, but when you just say it, it sort of falls flat. It's like Eddie and I always joke about my name in other, in like when we're in France, and it's like Sam just is like, ugh, Sam. Like, <laughs> Sammy, you can be. <laughs> So tone when you when someone's like, what are you calling your show? And you're like, tone, it just like they're gonna be like, what? Like it just doesn't sound like anything. But then when you see the word written, it's oh, like it, it, it is one of those words that is beautiful when it's written. I mean, it, it because it's only four four letters, it's it, they're actually, and if, if you do a lowercase t, it quite it's quite um, I don't know, strangely balanced word yeah. uh, visually. Um, so no, I can totally get that. I mean, this is the southern view of the show, uh, of the paintings in the, the larger room. Um, this view, the Southern view actually is a little bit more, if I dare say optimistic. I mean, the color palette is a little bit more um, uh, lighter, uh, slightly springy, you know, feels like kind of um, optimistic. Um, and, you know, it's interesting to me that in a way, even in the installation, and it may not even be conscious, um, that there is a kind of differentiation. This would be moving off to the Western wall and then uh, this would be the northern uh, wall, um, which has a you know little picture, uh, the piece um, side effect, and some of the darker tone works that kind of run against that space. And then that's the again the northern wall, and then moving towards back out to the entrance of the gallery. So. Installing the show, um, did you kind of bring everything? I mean, you said that that uh, in a way you you said to Sean to think help you a little bit to install. Were you were you already thinking about how the, the you know did you come in with a, a specific idea of how to hang these paintings, or you were kind of like I'm just going to put them on the floor, see where everything goes, or did you hang it first and then kind of you know uh, make editing decisions? No, no? I'm completely unprepared. Okay. Um, I like pushed myself so hard just making the show that I think my brain was like, and you're done. I was like, you have to install the show, you idiot. Uh, <laughs> so I had made, po well, these are so cumbersome to install that I'd actually made to scale posters of them to hang around. So Sean and I, uh, you know, spent some hours moving them around mm -hmm. and I, I worked so closely with each of these pieces and there's so much like intimacy with it that I had all these like kind of funky things I wanted to do. And Sean was like, let's present the work, Sam. Um, <laughs> so yeah, and I, and I think that I just sort of had to be like, you know, uh, a co-pilot on that to some degree, which I usually come in with like a very strict plan and, and I build a show around the install. And so this is an opposite experience for me. Well, I think it works very well. And in some ways, maybe um, because there are no, you know, it, you have the two dimensional work in one space, the sculptural work in another space, there's some, you know, a nice transition, you feel the relationship between the two gallery spaces, as you walk between them. But, um, you know, it, it's not as if you've made a stage set for both sides, you know, it's, there's a kind of a, a real difference. 
um, which I think works to your advantage and particularly does give you the ability to look at these uh, paintings and two dimensional works uh, without anything else in front of them. You can really stand in front of them and deal with them uh, on, uh, by themselves and also in the whole series of the works. Yeah. And I think that that's something to be said too about like when you have a gallery show, it's a collaboration with the gallery. And, mm -hmm. and I have a lot of respect for Sean and he's been doing this a very long time and he's a curator and he has a great sense, you know, sensibility. And so it is fun for me to collaborate on that, you know, as opposed to coming and be like, this is what we're doing. Right. It makes the show really feel like we're in it together when we make these choices together. You know, it really is his space that I'm collaborating with, you know, as much as it's my work that he's collaborating with with his space. Um, yeah. Thank you, Sam. Uh, so we do have a couple of questions, I think. Um, some greetings from Montreal, uh, some hellos from Hawaii. Question for Sam, what, what interests you most about stone as a sculptural material? It's a time machine. I think that it, well, not only is it like gorgeous and feels so good in your hand and has a spirit of its own where it pushes back. Um, I just think it's amazing. The layers of Time Machine where not only there's the geological, but there's also the more recent where, it, you know, how it's mined out of the mountains or what shape these pieces take on due to the material, the use it was meant for. You know, there's, there's the short-term history, the long-term history, it's just, I mean, it's like what we're standing on at all times, you know, it's amazing. Yeah, well, obviously at the Noguchi Museum, I have to think a lot about geological time and, and you know, the time of stones. It's a, a long, much longer than my lifetime and, you know, millennium. Um, so it, it, I do, I've also come to understand stone as a kind of uh, bridge between the past and the, the present and the future. Um, and it feels like a privilege to get to work with it. Mm -hmm. If you think about what it took to create, and I'm like, I get to do what I want with this. Crazy. Um, by the way, Phoebe Waller Bridge is the. Thank you. Yeah, we had, we had a couple of uh, answers there. Oh, lots of help. <laughs> Thank you. Too bad I like don't know how to open the chat and help myself. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, someone asks on the topic of painting with stone: Was using plaster a way to bring you closer to the material of stone uh, in a way that you weren't able to get before? As an artist who seamlessly blurs the line between painting and sculpture, does this blur the line further? Yeah, it definitely blurs the line further. I didn't think of it as like, I want to get closer to stone. What do I do? But I did think about, I want a surface that is in a closer conversation with the surface of stone, for sure. Mm -hmm. Someone is suggesting a movie that we should watch, uh, Il Capo, The Chief, uh, which is a look at marble quarrying in the Italian Alps. Oh, yeah, that's cool. cool 2014, one. check it out. <laughs> yeah, everyone's missing fingers. Exactly. Well, you know, we did. I mean, I, I, I was very happy that you could go visit uh, Zumi, uh, the, the yes. kind of stone cutter uh, who worked with Noguchi uh, when you were in Japan. Um, that was a good experience. That was an incredible experience. Brett set up a uh, ability for Eddie and I to meet Izumi at uh, Osama Noguchi's home. And I mean, he made his sculptures forever. And yeah. I got to take his hand and it felt, I mean, it was the closest I've ever come to like meeting someone that felt like a spiritual leader or something for me. I was like, I was pretty blown away by that experience. Um, Alex Perlstein asks, uh, thinking about how you improvise the joints, it's count how counterintuitive it seems from the outside to improvise with stone. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's it. You just, um, you get to know something and you're like, it, the rules don't have to apply. I can just use my um, intuitive knowledge of this material and do what I want with it and uh, it'll comply or it won't. <laughs> it's just the preciousness kind of gets washed away. You know, I think that stone often has this like, be careful, oh my God, you know, vibe to it. And uh, at this point, it's just, it's in plentitude in my life. So <laughs> I can take those risks for sure. Well, I mean, I think uh, uh, someone who works in stone, I mean, one of the things you have to learn is when things go wrong, how you solve those problems and still be able to reclaim a sculpture. I mean, Noguchi loved when things cracked open in the middle of the process. And then he was like, okay, well, let's just put this on the ground like that. You know, we're done. That's it. You roll with it. You know, we'll live with it. It's like, and you also, you get to know it just like any material. You get to know it. You know when something's got a flaw in it. You know when something's vulnerable. You know what works and what doesn't work. And that's, I don't know that I could have made these stone sculptures 10 years ago. You know, I probably needed the accumulative knowledge to know what they could, what the rock could and couldn't do. 
And um, yeah, so that's just like a, a privilege of time of working with that material, mm -hmm. which is what like Izumi is all about, right? Like he's like a stone whisperer. Absolutely, he is. Um, one more question. Uh, this is from uh, someone in the Q&A part, not the chat. Um, is there a material you've not worked with yet that you want to work with? Maybe this is a good place for us to also end the talk because I love the idea. This is the daisy chain problem. Yeah. Yes. I mean, totally. The the next thing I want to do is really have the um, component of the painting that we were talking about that's plaster be much more sculptural. I've been very lucky. I've gotten to work. Anytime I want to work in something, I just do it. I just work in it. So that's been glass, bronze, whatever. Um, plaster. I think I'm going to be exploring some clay. I'm not sure. You know, you also just have to get to a point where like you don't worry about the expertise of things. You know, I think a lot of people get intimidated by approaching things because they think they have to have this entire education on it before they use it as a supply. But everything is just a material you can use to make the thing you want. You know, you don't have to be the master. Well, being, you know, semi fearless is always, I think, a good, a, a good quality for an artist and not being afraid of working with things that you've never worked with before. Yeah. Uh, I like skill and I love craft and I love people who really know how to do things super well. But I also love things like someone just picks up clay and just starts to play with it. And sometimes the results can be really fantastic as well. I think it's that balance, too. And I think also you can bring people into your life that have that skill. You don't have to have it. Right. You can have a collaborative relationship with someone that does have it and that can be just as beautiful as doing it mm -hmm. you know? Sam, thank you so much uh, you, for your time. It's been great to chat again. Um, and oh, someone is asking just one last question, the work behind you, uh, is that something? That's my mom. Oh. <laughs> it's a teapot right. she did in There we have it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all for coming uh, on a Wednesday at three o'clock to four o'clock. Um, this is like the new uh, 7 p.m. on any given day. cocktail hour. Yeah, cocktail hour. <laughs> um, so we do really appreciate it. And Sam, always great to talk to you. And I learned from chatting with you. So thanks so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everyone.